the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hello everyone, welcome to this CUBE Conversation. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. I'm in the Palo Alto CUBE studios here with the quarantine crew doing the remote interviews during this time of COVID. Of course, we want to check in uh, with all of our great esteemed guests and CUBE alumni. We're here with Jerry Chen, partner at Greylock. Jerry, great to see you, it's been a while. Hope you're sheltering in place. Nice camera, nice setup you got there at home. Thanks for coming on. <laughs> Thanks, John. I set up all the, all the cameras just for you. Everybody needs their quarantine hobbies. And for me, I kind of dust off the audiovisual playbook and set this up just, just for the CUBE interviews. But it's good to see you. I'm glad you and the family are healthy and sane as well. Yeah, and same to you. Uh, let's just jump into it. Obviously, COVID-19 has caused the virtualization trend, virtual everything. You're no stranger to virtualization. At VMware, back in the day, uh, really changed the game on server virtualization, but the whole world's becoming virtual. And it's very interesting because now people are feeling what we in the industry have been talking about inside the ropes for a long time, which is the future's there. It's going to be uh, about interactions online, software, cloud scale. These things just got accelerated. And I mean, the disruption, yeah. the change of behavior, Zoom fatigue, uh, WebExing, all this stuff that's happening. People are kind of like, wow, this is the future. This is, this is a real impact and it's mainstream. Everyone's feeling about a business to personal. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think Satya Nadella at Microsoft had this quote recently that they've seen you know, two decades worth of digital acceleration and transformation in just two months. And I think what we've seen in the past four months, John, is all the kind of the first order effects of uh, virtualization events, not just infrastructure, but like virtualization of meetings and people, um, telemedicine, telehealth, online education, delivery of food, all that, all those trends have just accelerated. You know, we were buying stuff on e-commerce and Amazon and Instacart beforehand, that's just accelerated. We're moving towards virtualized events, online education, online healthcare, that's just accelerated. So I think we're seeing the first order effects of changing not only how we work, how we communicate, but how we shop and interact and, and socialize, it's accelerate, it compressed two decades within two to three months. And so I think that's changing both how you and I interact and how we build relationships, but also how companies interact with their customers and how companies interact with their employees. And it's, uh, it's been an exciting time because, you know, one, when there's disruption, there's opportunity, but two, it's giving guys like you and me a, a chance to kind of, you know, dust off or try new skills. And you and I are both figuring out how to exist and thrive in this world where we're now interacting in this virtualized world. And, it's, and it's, it's still the same game, personal relationships, content is now data. This is stuff that we've been yep. preaching on theCUBE. You've been on many times talking about, I got to get your thoughts as a venture capitalist, you know, whether you're making bets on the future for investments, you got to obviously a 10 year horizon, roughly speaking average on VC deals, enterprises and customers who are building out cloud and data centers, they got to make new bets or double down on stuff they've been doing or cancel stuff that they had going on and refactoring. So I want to get your thoughts on one, first on the VC side, how have you guys refactored your thinking, your meetings and your bets? Yeah, so I would say um, three areas. One is how we operate as a VC firm, what's changed. Number two, I'll talk about kind of what we're investing in, what's, what's good or bad. And thirdly, it's like what I think changes for our portfolio companies and how startups think. So first and foremost, like, you know, obviously we've gone all virtual too. With Shelter in Place, our entire team is now working remotely, working from home, but we're still open for business. So we're looking to find new investments. We are investing aggressively right now and we're just doing things over Zoom. And so we're either A, doing video calls as a partnership or doing video calls with startups that were meeting and founders. But I'll be honest, one thing I've done, John, is I've turned off the screen more or less. I've done more phone calls because I find that a video call is great for the first or second meeting, but with a founder or executive I have a relationship with, it's just really nice to actually, you know, go on a virtual walk where me and the founder were both put on AirPods, we'll, we'll take the phone and we'll just walk outside and kind of have a conversation that's a little bit higher bandwidth. So, I think how we're operating has changed a little bit, but to your point, it's the same business, connecting with a person one-on-one, -on -one, um, reading the market, reading the founder, and making a bet. So that hasn't changed. I think on the stuff we're investing in, like you said, all the trends around cloud and, and, and APIs and SaaS, that's accelerated. So all the trends around the new workplace, um, SaaS companies, collaboration, going cloud, that's accelerated faster. So some of our companies like Cato Networks that does software defined um, wide area networks plus cloud security, that's just accelerated. They're in this market called um, Secure Access Service Edge. We've seen kind of a nice tailwind from them. Um, more and more data is going to the cloud. So companies like Rockset, 
that's a database company that you had on the cube, they're going to see a benefit from that because more and more data is now in the cloud. Then finally, for the founders we work with, the way to go to market, the way they sell, like no one's flying around um, selling one-on-one anymore. You're not meeting a CISO, the CIO over a steak dinner, or you're not going to a conference anymore. So a lot of our companies are figuring out how to do more online sales, bottom up adoption. That could be an API, that could be open source, but trying to find kind of a more of a line of business entry to the company and sell that way versus go to a conference or for a one-on-one meeting. So it's interesting. Everything's moved faster, but then this slight curveball on how you connect with your customer has changed. And so, you know, what's the Darwin line? It's not the strongest that survives, but the most adaptable. So we're seeing the companies and the founders that are most adaptable right now, they're going to thrive. It's interesting, you know, we've always talked about it from a tech standpoint with DevOps and cloud native, integration or horizontally scalable has been an ethos of value creation. You've talked about moats in the past, but now it's more real life is emerging into, uh, becoming immersed into software. And so I want to get your thoughts on this. And we, we have a phrase here in the Cube team is that you know, every company will become a media company. That's something that we believe in. And you're starting to see that people doing more Zooms, doing more uh, digital events. You mentioned some of, the, some of the other things. Can you see any other examples where a company has to become blank? Because media is just one element of the new reality. It's just life, right? You've got to broadcast and you've got to share your stories and formats, that's media. Is there other areas we're seeing the things that weren't on the radar before with COVID where companies have to become something? Like every company will be blank, fill in the blank. I would say, you know, it's, it's tried to say, uh, one was every company's a data company. People have been saying that for a while. That's more true than ever. Number two, I'll be honest, every company now is a healthcare company, right? Because be it health insurance um, for your employees, the, the current pandemic is, is making the reality of both physical health and emotional health and mental health key for employees. And so if that was a, a top cost factor for hiring employees, it's going to be even more important going forward that every company is a healthcare company. And thirdly, like you said, every company is a media company. I would say every company is also either one of two things. They're a, a FinTech company because every company is now going online with their content. They want to create a one-to-one um, commercial relationship with their customer, right? That could be ads, could be transaction, could be selling something. So you're now doing business directly with your customer. So every company is a FinTech company. And I would say every company is now also, like you said, a content company, right? It's, it's the media you're creating, but also the data you're taking, um, the value add on top of the data you're, you're creating, and then how you share that back to your customer. So you as an enterprise company or consumer company, you're collect data from your users, you're going to use that data to improve your product. And this could be a, a SaaS offering, this could be an application, but then take that data through real-time analytics, then make your product better. And so because of that, if you're a data company, Real-time data, like uh, our, our database company mentioned earlier, Rockset, becomes more important. If you're a fintech company, so all things around payments or commercial banking and, and relationship with your customer makes sense. And then if you're a healthcare company, because you know all your employees are now caring about healthcare, just thinking about how to make um, communication of healthcare with your employees a lot more efficient. And, and a, a part of the part of the reason why to work for the cube or work for a, a startup is important. So I think those three things are, are are top of mind for all employees and all employers. And I think things could change in the next six or nine months, but right now I see those three being front and center. It's interesting. I wonder if you can add real estate company to that because if you look at the work from home dynamic, yeah. I had a friend who uh, was a, a, a fellow dad with my son's lacrosse team. He lives in Los Gatos. He's been involved in Google, Tesla, building out their facilities. And he had an interesting guest post on SiliconANGLE. He was saying, it's not just give them some extra pay for their internet access. Companies got to rethink the facilities question, right? Because yeah. do you pay rent for your, um, your employees? Do you provide the VPN beyond VPN security, for instance? So again, you start to th see these new opportunities or challenges, open up new thinking. This is going to be a wave of exactly. opportunity. Well, that, that virtualization between work and home has now been blurred, like you said earlier, John. And so if you're a technology company that enables remote access or um, distributed access, like uh, Cato Networks, when the portfolio comes in Greylock around, you know, a uh, remote office, home office, that is now diotone, right? So I had this um, conversation with um, Jay Srinivasan, asked Spoke, one of our companies, there's like a Maslow hierarchy for uh, working now. And at the, at the base of the Maslow hierarchy is like good internet access, right? <laughs> Just, that's diotone. They need security, right? Because if you don't have secure access, 
you, you, you can't work. And then you have to have some kind of information management, knowledge management, how do you communicate, right? And then collaboration. So you have now this new hierarchy of, of what is required to, to work in this new world, but also um, the tools and the technologies, be it, you know, um, secured access service ads like Cato, or you know, IT help desk for all your employees like like Ask Spoke. Both of those things become um, dial tone for any remote work. Just like video conferencing, we can do this you know in the same way 10, 15 years ago. That's become kind of a, a must have. And so, I think it'd be fascinating how we went from an office world where I gave you a laptop, a computer, a desk to this home office world where maybe you now have to pay for my my fancy camera setup and my VPN. Well, certainly getting, you're getting good ROI on your setup and I'm sure the Greylock will take care of that. Get plenty of dough, big billions of dollars under management. And by the way, Maslow hierarchy in our house is ping and internet access. So you know, we fight <laughs> for that ping time. I got 12, I'm like, what's going on? Who's gaming? I got to get the kids off, off of Twitch, uh, whatnot. But in, in all seriousness, this is what the reality is. So, yeah. so um, now for the average person out there, there's a lot of discussion around mental health. You mentioned, you know, taking it off the video conferencing and going for a walk or just talking on the phone. This speaks to the humanization aspect of what's going on. Mental health, social interaction, we're social creatures. Collaboration has to be reimagined. What's your view on all this? Uh, I think absolutely. Look, humans are social creatures by nature. And I think part of the reason why I had this conversation with my founders early during um, COVID-19, that it's both a healthcare crisis it's an economic crisis with all the millions and millions of people uh, unemployed, but it's also uh, an emotional crisis because one, we're, we're not connected to our family and friends and loved ones, and we're sheltering at home with you know either ourselves or just a handful of people. And so we're trying to figure out ways to like uh, recreate uh, social connections. And that's a phone call, it's, it's, a, it's a video call, it's, it's um, these Zoom dinners or Zoom parties is key. I think you know going on socially distant walks are is another thing to kind of like play and, and, and experience things together. But my two cents is if you're a startup right now, it can help connect people work wise or um, socially. That's just going to be super critical for the new experience. And I think people are discovering new ways to use technology. So Zoom was never meant to be used the way it is today. I think that's amazing. I think how people think about voice, video, and email and chat are changing as well. As well, it's like so, I'm finding new ways to like you know play games online with my nieces, right, or communicate with them. And I think as an employer in these companies, like HR software and how you like manage and coach and lead your employees is going to change as well. And so you have this um, world where we're all in one building, and think about how you as a CEO or as a leader now can actually coach, develop, and enable your employees, you know, across the world. I want to get your thoughts on cloud. We've had many conversations around cloud computing, as the rise of AWS. I remember one, there was a big Twitter conversation, I think about last year where, what enabled Amazon? And, and I think one of the things that came out of it was um, virtualization enabled them to have all these different servers. What do you see coming out of this virtualization of our lives with um, the, the COVID-19? As people start to figure out beyond the triage of stabilization, and as they get foundationally set up in COVID, coming out of it, companies and people have to have a growth strategy, whether it's life or business. Yep. But people want to come out of this on, on the up, upside, um, whether it's emotional or with their business. How do you, what do you see being enabled? What needs to be in place? What kind of scale? What kind mm -hmm. of environment? Because this is where I think the entrepreneurs are really going to sharpen their energy on their creativity, is looking at the expectations and experience needed coming out of this. It may look completely different than what we were talking about a year ago. What's your thoughts? Um, well, I think individually, people can use this time to improve their skills in different ways, right? So I think as an employee, as a CEO, as a founder, you, know, you take the time to like invest in new skills and that could be, hey, how do I communicate, collaborate and manage my team remotely? So I think uh, CEOs and founders that can understand how to motivate, educate, train their employees in this new world, well, that those are skills going forward, right? So. Communication has always been a great skill, John, for any leader, any founder. It's 10X more important in this new virtualized work world. Communication, motivation, and, and leading people over, over remote work is going to be a new skill that people have. Managing remote teams, managing fully distributed teams or half distributed, half headquarters. So understanding how to organize uh, and lead your team in this kind of half in the office, half out of the office world, that's going to be a, a challenge as well. So any tools, technology, and tips there. But I think in terms of the founders that can now um, hire employees, um, find customers, sell customers, 
and you know manage a distributed team. Those three things um, in this new world, even post current COVID nineteen, we're not going back to the way we were. So the ability to actually use skills around um, email, creating content, Slack, Zoom, video chat, online conferences. You know what was that? Um, you know, video killed the radio star, right? The, the first MTV video. So, you know, COVID-19 and Zoom and video collaboration, you know, what does that do to the old skills of the old founders and what do they enable? So just like, you know, TV replaced radio as a medium, and now this virtualized world is going to replace kind of the, the medium we had beforehand. So uh, there'll be a new generation of founders and investors um, coming out of this generation that would be, you know, for, for the next 10, 15 years. And I'm excited to be part of that. Yeah, and it's super oppor big opportunity because as those you have these kind of medium changes, new protocols get developed, new responsibilities and roles emerge, value creation, capture equations change, right? So you're looking at things completely like online events, for instance, they don't happen anymore. And even when they do come back, they'll probably be hybrid anyway. So you got virtual, hybrid, public, sounds like a cloud play to me, public events, hybrid events, and private events, I guess, I mean. I mean yeah, vir virtual private events, but it's the same thing holds, just like cloud internet increased the reach, right? So all of a sudden you can reach a bigger audience than just radio, TV, or the newspaper. Now you have these virtualized events, like you said, private events, public events, hybrid events, you as a company or a media property like the cube can now reach a, a larger audience, right? Like it's, it's global. It's, you don't have to be there in person. You're going to have um, the remote audience as a first class citizen now more than ever. It's just like the internet replacing newspaper and print. People really care about print and newspaper, but really the reach online is or to magnitude larger than print. So all of a sudden you thought more about the print, uh, so the, the online audience more than print audience. So now going forward, you're gonna think about the virtual audience that's remote versus the physical audience. And so you're gonna have to create experiences that are that are world class for both properties. So just like the cloud, you think about uh, you know, you know, the big three cloud providers, private cloud, as a technology company, you think about all three um, venues are all three infrastructures as a first class citizen, right? It's not going to be all one cloud. It's not all going to be one, one kind of um, one note, if you will. So it forces everyone to think not just, you know, kind of one path, but multiple paths. So like classic problem is a lot of founders think, okay, I'm going to do a, a, a enterprise private cloud strategy only, or I'm going to do a, a cloud only SaaS strategy. Now founders have to do both at the same time. I got to address the private cloud on-premise business at the same time as the cloud business, and not just one cloud, three or four clouds around the world. So it forces founders to be able to do more things at one time, and the ability for a company to attack multiple venues or multiple territories at the same time, they'll be successful. And the days where you and I can just do one cloud or one venue or one audience, those are gone. And so, yeah. you know, Folks like yourself, John, and what you built here at the Cube with everyone else, they can reach multiple audiences at the same time. That's going to be very powerful. And we're going to be marketing and doing a lot more online events. Like you said, it's going to be easier to tap into our 7,000 plus alumni to get people together to create great content. And again, content value to remote audience is interesting. So I, that shifts into the conversation of everyone talks about the remote worker. Well, what about the remote customer, the remote prospects? So this is going to change how companies have to be change their behaviors. And it's going to be driven by developers because it's not like one app can solve it because you got to integrate. You got to have some integration points. So this is the question. Are we moving away from that monolithic SaaS app? Or is it going to be some SaaS apps that need to integrate with others? Will there be an abstraction layer of innovation around it? Because at the end of the day, these new workloads and these new apps got to be built. I mean, if you're going to run an event, if I'm a SAP or a big company, I'm not going to rely or may not want to rely on a vendor. In fact, the CEO of SAP said, because their site crashed for their event, I'm not going to rely on a third party to run my business event. Because their business model is the event, not just yeah. a supplier selection for a SaaS app. So interesting kind of new, surge of online activity might tip the scales for the supplier side. I, I think you're right, John. I think because now the, just like the, the IT technology is now your business, 
you're going to basically do one of two things. One, uh, vet the IT technology provider that much higher or harder. But number two, to your point, I think the way you sell and reach companies is going to be uh, through the developers. And yes, you're going to have these large monolithic SaaS apps before, but almost every SaaS app now um, has APIs for integration. And so to your point is that integration, the ability to have multiple companies work together and share data and collaborate, that's going to be more important. And so really, you know, at Greylock and myself, I've been like investing in developer-led technologies, developer-led adoption, or API or open source-led adoption for, for seven plus years now. And the truth of the matter is that's going to be even more powerful going forward. Like Nassim Taleb would say that's anti-fragile, right? So having one giant app is fragile, but having a bunch of small apps or a bunch of like APIs or, or a bunch of developers using your open source technology or using your, your API technology to build an application, that's anti-fragile because at the end of the day, you know, that's going to be more reliable for your for your your customer than a single point of failure, which could be one giant application. So all the big apps like Salesforce, now they're platforms, right? They have APIs, they have extensibility. They understand that there's a, there's a long fat tail of solutions you need to build. And all the new startups are doing open source or API-led adoption because they understand that's the fastest route to create value for the customer is also the most robust technology stack that a customer can build on top. I think that's super insightful. In fact, that is, I think, so compelling because if you think about it, that's the formula for great investments from a startup standpoint. But now because of COVID, as you said, everything's been pulled forward and accelerated at the same time. There's a collision. Not all the enterprises are that strong. They're not that developer-led, so I think to the point about acceleration, now the enterprises, and we've seen pockets of this with cybersecurity where they have their own you know, in-house teams you know, doing a variety of different development. The customers have to be developer led because that's where the value is. So they have to have a supplier with the right stack and integration frameworks. Now the customers who haven't really been developer led have to be developer led. What's your take on that? <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely true. I mean, like 20 years ago, the CIO of a, of a company used to be the monopoly supplier technology for the company. They decided what, what hardware to use, what servers, what stores to use, what applications to buy. And then all of a sudden, like Amazon came around and said, well, look, here's a set of APIs, go build what you want. And so the competition for kind of like the centralized decision-making became Amazon. And guess what? CIOs reacted, they got better, they got smarter. And those that embraced kind of like an API developer-led uh, adoption became the CIOs you want to have in the company. So I think, you know, CIOs in this, in this cloud mobile era have adopted that um, philosophy that, look, my job now as a CIO is enable my developers, my employees, which are really the assets of the company is the people to have the right tools. So here acts to a bunch of cloud APIs like, you know, rock set or whatever for data, or here's a bunch of um, resources or open source technologies um, for you to pull. So like I invested in a company recently called Chronosphere. It's an open source technology around um, metrics and monitoring. So, hey, use this open source time series database for monitoring your cloud and build upon that. And they're not going to say, we're going to pick, you know, one large vendor that's monolithic. We're going to say, here's an open source tech company or a cloud API, go build upon that. And the companies that are embracing that um, philosophy of, of API-led or developer-led, John, they're going to be far and ahead um, uh, the better CIOs and better companies because the rate of digital adoption has just gone you know, exponential. So we were on this super fast path already. And with quarantine and COVID, we've just accelerated all that digital transformation. So every brick and mortar retailer now has to be e-commerce retailer. So they're making a slow digital transformation to go from brick and mortar stores to online stores. Now, like brick and mortar retail is pretty much not happening and probably won't come back to the same levels for a while. They need to accelerate their move towards digital, digital transformation, right? And it certainly exposes uh, so the, the um the people who haven't really made those investments because literally action is the is the the mandate now. Take action, make those changes. Um, totally want to dig into this developer-led uh, vision because I think that's very real. And the new decisions got to be be made on what to do. I mean, I'm I'm happy to see the DevOps thinking, agile speed become the table stakes. So so with that, um, this week Google is having their nine-week digital mm. event over 200 plus sessions. Uh, essentially an asynchronous event. It's going to be sprinkled out. They kind of pretty much released the videos, most of them today. Uh, over the next eight, nine weeks, you're going to see a lot of videos. Um, Google, um, one of the big three, got AWS, Azure, Google. What's your assessment of the, the horses on the track relative to cloud? 
Look, I think you and I have been talking about this for, you know, seven, eight, nine years when you and I first met at like in the, the first or second Amazon re-event, what was the forecast? And then we said, well, you know, it's not a winner take all, but right now it's a winner take most. Amazon's clearly the market share leader. Azure, you know, coming up um, quickly behind the enterprise. Google's a third, but they're doing some um, smart things around technology. So uh, Google announced a bunch of things today, which I think are very smart. So, for example, they, they announced BigQuery Omni, which is BigQuery that can query their kind of data warehouse. You can also query data in private cloud, Azure, Amazon. And so, strategically, if you're the number three player, you're going to you know, push a multi-cloud agenda with BigQuery Omni or Google Anthos, which is kind of a multi-cloud platform. And you know, for, for Google, I think it's the right strategy. I also think it's the right strategy for most customers to be multi-cloud because you can't be dependent upon you know, a single point of failure in your applications. You can't be dependent upon a single cloud as well. So I think multi-cloud is probably the direction we're headed as, as cloud matures. And I think Google's making a bunch of the right choices around embracing multi-cloud. And, and today they made that choice with um, BigQuery Omni. And so I think, you know, they're playing catch up, but they're, they're playing that game. I think um, Amazon's clearly still in the lead and still, you know, it blows my mind and it's continually impresses me what they've done over the past 10 years in terms of proving, you know, the cloud offering and the cloud services up and down the stack. And I think the past, you know, five, six years, what Azure's done has been super impressive in terms of, you know, Microsoft embracing open source, embracing, you know, um, cloud as an ethos against, um, their 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 legacy business of operating systems and servers on premise. They've done a, a great job embracing the next generation. But I do think looking around the corner, um, this new developer led you know mindset is going to matter, right? So the the cloud of tomorrow will be APIs like Stripe for payments, uh, Twilio for communication. Um, so I see the the next evolution not just being VMs and containers, but also a bunch of cloud services around data, security, and privacy. And you know the cloud vendor can build this next generation of you know database APIs or privacy APIs, security APIs that they're going to be in, in the catbird seat for the the next ten years of applications that are going to be built. And it'll be interesting to your developer led uh, position our conversation around that. If the developer is going to be leading. Is it going to be an abstraction layer across multiple clouds? Or do I have to have my Google developers and my Amazon developers and my Azure developers? How do you see that playing out? Because I do believe developer-led is the way. The question is, how do you figure out not, how do you avoid forking resources, right? So you might want to have a yeah. hedge, I get that. But if I'm going to go double down on say a cloud, I'm going to go deep. I'm going to hire developers. It's interesting. History history would suggest you have multiple teams. Remember, um, you know, we used to have a, a Unix team or Sun team inside companies, right? You had a you had a Windows team, you had a kind of a Solaris Linux team, and there was a Microsoft team and you know, a non Microsoft team in, in most companies, and um, you know they didn't really work well together, and they had kind of two 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 groups in most companies. You know, I think that was an okay way to get started, but ultimately, to your point that was not cost effective. It also was um, defeating because you now you had to like have two everything. Okay, what was my data backup strategy? Okay, I have a Windows backup strategy and a, a Unix Solaris backup strategy. So I think we're not going to make the same mistake again, right? Yeah. I think we're going to have to have multiple clouds, Amazon, Google, Azure, and then on-premise private cloud. So call it, you know, three, four or five clouds. And then you're going to have a set of tools that can abstract away not 100% of the clouds, but I think you know the, the best developer tools, the best APIs will be multi-cloud. So I can get 80% or 90% of what I want to be done through this developer-led you know, um, layer of APIs, be it databases or analytics. And then you know, 10 to 20% of the code you can write will be able to take care of what's unique to Amazon, what's unique to Azure, what's unique to, um, to Google, or what's unique to your own private cloud. But I think we're seeing a layer of technology and that's um, uh, true in all the startups we back and true in all the startups I see that lets you get most of the way done with a, with a single platform, single set of technologies. And that's what customers want, right? They don't want to create multiple fiefdoms. They want, you know, they want one choice. set of technologies. They want, they want choice, but the reality is they don't always get it. I want to go through a throwback to 2010 when Paul Moritz said at VMware, our first Cube a gig, he said, there's a hardened top, okay? The hardened top was, you don't worry about what's underneath the top, we're just going to focus on the top of the stack. That was classic kind of, you know, the stack would develop and you had standardization. You mentioned you had Windows teams and Unix teams, but also you could argue that, you know, back then you had Cisco and Wellfleet vendors, but you didn't have two teams of routers. You had one yep. standard and you, that ran the remote, you know, interoperably OSPF routing, whatever you had going on. 
So you had some standards, some standardization. How do you um, view that? Because you want some standardization to have the interoperability, the SLAs and the security. At the same time, you want to have flexibility kind of above what may be called a hardened top. Is there a hardened top in multi-cloud? You know, I'd say there's not, the hard top doesn't exist in the same way. I think in, you know, the ba back in the day you had proprietary technologies, operating systems and, you know, firmware, right? So Windows was closed. A lot of the, the network operating systems were closed source. Now you can't get away with that. So you have open source technologies today and, and public APIs. And so the, the pressure of both one competition two public APIs that people can read, copy, adjust, three, open source, and just customer demand not to be locked into a hard top anymore, that's largely going to go away. So I think most of the major vendor success will try to kind of more or less lock you in and keep you stuck on their platform, their technology. And that's fine, right? Every successful company should be able to do that. But I think the ability to lock you in through proprietary software operating systems, that's not going to happen anymore. I, I see through cloud and open source, what we've seen is kind of the interoperability and flexibility is the default. If you can't um, you know, meet those needs, customers would go other ways. Yeah. I mean, there'll be proprietary technologies, proprietary extensions along the way, but you know, 60, 70% of what you want is going to be um, compatible with most technologies, most clouds. If you're, you're not going to offer choice and freedom to your customers, they'll go elsewhere. So because outside if, of you don't offer, if you don't offer a flexible solution, John, someone else will, yeah. and the customers will choose a more flexible solution. I, I would agree with you. Outside of latency, which is the laws of physics, value is the lock-in. If you're creating value, that's really what the customers want. They get to capture that value. Well, Jerry, great to have you on. Love the new setup. We're going to have to make this um, more of it. We can bring you in on the podcast when we get on um, Zooms over the weekend, maybe put a panel together. Let's get Carl Eschebach and some uh, VMware alums to come on, give the perspective, uh, what's going on. And I thank you for taking the time and. Great to see that you're healthy and doing well. Thanks. You too. Thanks, John. Anytime. I love being on the Cube. So uh, look forward to my next trip. All right, Jerry Chen, great Cube alumni. Our first interview, oh, nine years ago, he brought that up. That was uh, the second reInvent. Boy, has the world changed and it's only going to accelerate even faster. Everything's changing. New bets are being made. Decisions have to be evolving quickly and faster. If you're not fast, you will be, be in the pile of dead companies and, and not making it. So Jerry Chen, breaking it down as venture capitalist for Greylock. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE. Thanks for watching.